Dallas. <laughs> I don't feel too well. Welcome back to episode 10 of Dictate, Dissect, and Discuss. Today, we will finish part 2 of Josephine Armistead's The Silicon Ideology, starting with Highlight 16. In 1990, Eric S. Raymond emerged, taking over the jargon file, a cornerstone of the old hacker culture that died in 1983. Raymond is a libertarian. Stallman is a social democrat. In 1998, Raymond piggybacked off of Stallman's concept of free software to create a version more appealing for corporations, open source. From this, and from his maintenance of the jargon file, Raymond began to play a brief, though influential, role in Silicon Valley culture, which, due to the proliferation of startups suddenly gaining money in the dot-com bubble, and to the normalization of neoliberalism under Clinton, was especially receptive to techno-libertarianism. Note the language in use by the author here, open source, not free and open source. Open source software is a great starting point towards creating more libre software, but there comes with it a caveat. Most times it is not free as in free use, free ability to change or alter the code, or free as in no cost. Open source shows transparency, but at the same time, it still restricts certain parts of its design from true libre use. It shares a similar ethos with the old hacker culture of York, but it has more appeal to big businesses because of the inherent need to speak of transparency while still making money and gatekeeping your product behind corporate bars. Neoliberalism was becoming normalized now, where it has first found root amongst the Reaganites, and the startup shared the same zeitgeist. Techno-libertarians found a home here between the rapidly expanding technology sector, the dot-com bubble, Silicon Valley, the liberalization of the internet, and the birth of startup culture and consumer internet interest. Seventeen. In 1994, Richard J. Herrnstein and Charles Murray released The Bell Curve, Intelligence and Class Structure in American Life, a pseudoscientific work that had the effect of making blatant, as opposed to implied, scientific racism respectable again amongst the white professional population. The Bell Curve had made the case to pass the 1994 Crime Bill and End Welfare as We Know It, to the American populace, and the reaction against it allowed the authors to feign persecution through the all-powerful term political correctness. We shall see this again later in the NRX predisposition towards Rothbard, an ardent defender of the bell curve. In 1993, ministers from East and Southeast Asian countries adopted the Bangkok Declaration, and this combined with the narrative of the four Asian tigers, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan, in the rhetoric of Lee Kuan Yew and Mathahir Mohammed, helped create the myth of Asian values, neoliberal free market economics, a Confucian cultural heritage, predisposition towards an authoritarian one-party government, rule of law, preference for social harmony over personal freedoms, a Protestant work ethic, frugality, and loyalty, a sort of Confucian version of Weber's glorification of the Protestant work ethic. Despite the 1997 Asian financial crisis, libertarians and their respectable publications, such as The Economist, continued to fawn over Singapore and Lee Kuan Yew, whose reign can be seen as a prototype for the NRXers, one that embraced eugenics to maintain the supremacy of the Chinese relative to the Indians and the Malays. Ruled by a single party with little crime, as even the most minor infractions, such as chewing gum, are punished harshly, often with caning, in a rich financial industry, with the city operating an investment firm, whose CEO, 
Ho Ching is the wife of dictator Li, sorry for the pronunciation here, Sen Lung, whose portfolio is roughly equivalent to the city's GDP. Using pseudoscientific facts to justify racism is exactly the same thing we see nowadays with tough-on-crime policies. The crimes committed are usually by POC because of systemic policies put in place to disenfranchise them. The war on crime is a war on POC crime. People like the authors of The Bell Curve use their scientific racism vis-a-vis -vis IQ to give credence to institutionalized racism. Biological racism and phrenology further explicate the strange fascination racist scientists have with biology. The mere thought that black people, Hispanics, indigenous people, usually Native Americans, and Asians have different skull shapes that, and features that consequently make them act out and make them predisposed to certain bad traits of character is ludicrous. However, the emphasis on IQ and the obsession with it in schooling and in academia at levels of institutional research is due in part to the bell curve. But by far the worst outcome of all this was that neo-reactionaries, including the authors themselves, took the opportunity to cloak their insidious nature behind a wall of, it's just evidence bro, why can't we have a convo? I'm being silenced. As if the charlatans needed another excuse for their bold-faced web spinning. Segwaying into the four Asian tigers point, I think this is a good time to comment on this strange stereotype mismatch that Americans seem to have about Asia. It's either a degenerate commie hellhole, or they're the smart tech wizards who work hard and have this utopian world of half-breed, hive-mind crime and punishment, cleanliness, and order. The last sentence was very strange, but futurist technocrats like to fashion themselves as the gatekeepers of the free world. They don't just see Asia as being full of sneaky, aggressive tiger moms and dads. They see a quick, efficient, slick, innovative society that runs on discipline, meritocracy disguising plutocracy, a weird hybrid of strong government and equ <clears throat> equally strong businesses, and fairness under the eyes of currency. It's a dream where you can build your way to talk to God, even though that vision is built on pillars built of iron-fisted sand. Eighteen, The people who would later become the alt-right embraced Miller's right-wing, misogynistic politics and identified with Rorschach and Watchmen, a paleoconservative conspiracy theorist who was Alan Moore's caricature of Batman in the real world. In 1988, Moore would write V for Vendetta. Despite Moore's and the comics' leftist themes, its aesthetics were pilfered by the people who would become NRXers, who had fashioned themselves as, at the time as anarcho-capitalists. The fucking joke came out. This fed into the 1990s tough-on-crime outlook, and the comic books of the 1990s would lack any of the depth of The Dark Knight Returns or Watchmen, instead being a mere monument to masculinity and male violence. Another science fiction movement whose aesthetics would be appropriate despite left-wing politics was cyberpunk, especially the movie The Matrix. In 1987, Games Workshop released Warhammer 40k, whose tagline was, In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. The aesthetics of war and its technology thus became commodified, especially through the lens of the Imperium of Man faction, which was a theocratic regime ruled by the immortal god-emperor of mankind. This can be seen as the most obvious example of a larger trend of the aesthetics of war, destruction, and the technology of war being embraced by this culture, one that would accelerate with the creation of the first-person shooter with Wolfenstein 3D and Doom. In 1997, South Park began to air. Its crude humor, vulgar libertarianism, with a smug conceit that those who didn't agree were merely idiots, 
and accusations of opponents of political correctness and censorship were to be a formulative influence on the alt-right, whose first name was South Park Republicans. Alan Moore has had his characters and his work's ideological nuances dragged through hell and back. It seems conservatives, neocons, and neo-reactionary fascists of all stripes are intent on misrepresenting his every word. There comes a point where the info will fly over everyone's head and there will be no acknowledgement of the true nature of these characters. You are not supposed to sympathize with Rorschach. You are not supposed to sympathize with people who are nihilistic, paranoid, and dangerous. The stupid guy Fox Max is now used by edgy anonymous wannabes. It's all a joke. ANCAP share a similar ethos to all those dark and scary takes on our favorite comics. They are, to an extent, comfortable with seeing humanity as mean-spirited composites who violate and must be deterred with force, arbitrary moral lines in the sand upheld by more force, and whose animal desires can only be sated via escaping the stone that sunk the running dogs. They see the world as Hobbes did, and that's why the core tenets of their philosophy revolve around negative axioms. Don't is the word of the day because they assume the worst of their neighbors. When you remove yourself from the disappointing milieu, then, and only then, can you make something of yourself. They would fit right in on Pink Floyd's Animals album. The aesthetics of war and destruction presuppose that we want to see destruction, and perhaps that's why there's all this fear-mongering about robots taking over the world. Because the world, in the futurist eyes, belong to those who build the robots. The machines will lead us to victory and they will not be the ones under the heel of poverty, starvation, and death if the time comes. And by the way, I'm not touching on the whole South Park Republican or South Park Libertarian claim because I just don't think it's true. <laughs> Nineteen. It is this vulgar positivism that created its own movement to justify Islamophobia in 2004, the new atheist. Religion was inherently evil and violent, and Islam especially so, and began to use religion as the measures of all evil. Everything that was bad or wrong was somehow because of religion or analogous to religion. This movement was led by Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, and Christopher Hitchens. Continental philosophy, and especially feminism, were ridiculed for its methodology, jargon, and perceived intrusion into matters of science. This affair permanently marred the new atheist, making him hostile to leftism in all forms, and especially feminism. The methodology of science was seen then as the only legitimate means of accessing truth. New atheism was to profoundly influence the culture of less wrong, Reddit, and 4chan, providing the core beliefs and arguments of them. In 2008, Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency indeed, the canonical example of a cryptocurrency, was invented. As long as Bitcoin looks stable and interesting, libertarianism could retain a measure of respectability and could use it as a tool to recruit more libertarians. Atheists have taken their criticisms of religion to its natural conclusion. Acting as the morality crusaders they consider theists to be and advocating for the freedom of these followers from their shackles. What people like Richard Dawkins fail to realize is that Islamophobia can be cloaked under the guise of self-righteous emancipation from organized religion, never mind that some people are quite happy following a set of guiding moral principles and using the system as a comfort and social tool for emotional fulfillment. Religion became the litmus test for evil. Again, very ironic, the very negation of a set of value judgments and principles thinks they are fit to be the arbiters of morality. 
and soon enough, people began campaigning for unbiased science as the ultimate source of reason. Continental philosophy, full of critical theory philosophers, caught their ire because it purports to analyze the world through a pro-structuralist framework, that science and rational discourse are not the only things that can explain sociological phenomena, feminism, also for the same reason. Neo-reactionaries hate the thought that the world is more complicated than just biology says XYZ and God's not real. No, I will not hear about nuance because it's all the hackneyed BS made by schizophrenic emotional losers who can't live in the real world like me. Bitcoin as a new and subversive form of non-fiat currency made the gov bad crowd cheer because what's better than replacing paper currency with, get ready for this, digital currency? You would think there would have been an attempt to dismantle currency so as to democratize commodity exchange and our very fabric of trade, but no. It was just another marketing tactic. I'm convinced being a market-oriented neo-reactionary is just worshipping the almighty dollar, a fetishized cult of the production profit axis. In 2009, Moldbug had a falling out with Patrick Friedman, grandson of Milton Friedman, who called for a, quote, a more politically correct dark enlightenment, end quote, and began raising money for the Seasteading Institute, a libertarian project to build artificial islands outside of national borders where libertarians could govern. PayPal's founder, Peter Thiel, is funding the Seasteading Institute, as well as the various startups run by Moldbug and Balaji Srinivasan. In that same year, Thiel wrote in an essay for the Cato Institute, quote, I no longer believe that freedom and democracy are compatible, end quote. In the same essay, he claimed that democracy was ruined when white women got the right to vote in 1920. While this never mentioned Moldbug or Neo Reaction, it sent the signal that he is an NRXer. First of all, a more politically correct Dark Enlightenment is a phrase that gives me a seizure. <laughs> Second of all, how much megalomania juice do you have to drink in the morning to consider funding a project that gives you off an offshore island with which to rule over? What's the point of that? Is it a LARP? I can't tell. I guess the name seasteading relates to homesteading, the concept of building your own off-the-grid home and being completely self-sufficient. However, I think this project is more of a phallic contest to, to see who can exemplify the most archetypal god-king image in postmodern America. And this is a quote from Peter Thiel. Quote, A startup is basically structured as a monarchy. We don't call it that, of course. That would seem weirdly outdated, and anything that's not dem democracy makes people uncomfortable. We are biased towards the Democratic Republican side of the spectrum. That's what we're used to from civics classes. But the truth is that startups and founders lean towards the dictatorial side because that structure works better for startups." End quote. He doesn't, of course, claim that this would be a good way to rule a country, but that is the clear message sent by his political projects. 25. Of course, a man like Thiel, who believes democracy and freedom are incompatible, would want to make a quasi-feudalist paradise where he gets to live like a rich misanthrope. He's saying what everyone already knows on a primordial level, that startups are vertical hierarchies designed to reward the innovation of first come, first serve, and revitalize mercantilism in the modern world. If you can run a business like that, and remember, the business of America is business, then why wouldn't it work for a nation?
22. Aside from the backing of Silicon Valley, Neo Reaction grew immensely outside of its Bay Area base in the wake of the financial crisis, and intensified as all that the liberal establishment could offer was a $700 billion bailout to a crooked financial industry which ought to have been destroyed and austerity, neoliberalism's newest excuse by which to destroy the welfare state, making life nigh impossible for students, the disabled, and the poor. Austerity had come and would not be stopped. The center claimed to have solved the problem and that a recovery was underway, but no one believes their lies anymore. Youth unemployment is still up, income inequality is still up, and wage growth hasn't budged. As a result of decades of leftists holding their nose and affiliating with centrists, the left was unable to organize into a strong independent revolutionary organization or come up with a compelling counter-narrative against the soporifics of centrism. The biggest beneficiary politically was then the neo-reactionaries. Remember last episode when we talked about how fascists take advantage of impotent, aborted revolutions and manipulate people's vulnerability under a failed system to their advantage? Well, here's a good example of that. When the liberal establishment just perpetuates the bad behavior that got us all into this mess in the first place and pats the bankers on the backs, people are going to break at the seams. This isn't just a little wound. People lost houses, jobs, stocks, etc. Austerity has, inadvertently, caused more radicalization in many directions than almost anything else financially, sans, I would say, the current COVID pandemic. Bailouts to crooks seems to prove the neo-reactionaries' claims. And what's worse, it's easy to see why someone who lost their home would buy into this rhetoric. Centrist pandering to a, we're all in this together kumbaya, did nothing. Young people, some of the most politically ambitious, were left bereft of help and were radicalized. The left became splintered and their trust was worth dust. So the reactionaries won the day. Twenty-three. Originally, and to an extent today, 4chan had several cultures based on the board in particular and its topic of discussion. However, the anonymity and lack of moderation made its user base quickly homogenize, especially in the random B board. Shock value-centric humor, which, though originally supposedly ironic in the vein of the use of fascist imagery by punk, metal, and industrial bands, quickly became earnest, and surrounding racism, misogyny, homophobia, and transphobia was the centerpiece of the culture, and so the user base quickly became limited to young white cis straight men, who could show their investment in structures of power. This made 4chan an excellent place for recruitment by white supremacists, patriarchs, etc., who, at the time, were centered on David Duke's website Stormfront who quickly took over the board's news and later poll. Furthermore, this culture lended itself easily to raging against uppity members of marginalized populations. With large numbers of anonymous masses who could easily be whipped into a rage, 4chan developed new harassment tactics. Most of these developed out of old troll techniques that originated on Usenet in the 1990s. But now instead of merely being used for laughs, though this was still the stated intention, these were largely weaponized against marginalized people in raids. In 2014, the biggest example of this occurred with the debacle known as Gamergate. In order to understand that, we must remember that traditionally in America, video games had been marketed to the audience that was likely to use 4chan and engaged in the aestheticization of war and technology. But women, people of color, and LGBT people had always played games and were a quickly growing audience for video games. Thus, in recent years, games that did not feature or emphasize the aestheticization of war and technology or the objectification of women had grown in popularity and critical acclaim, much to the displeasure of the traditional audience of video games. They wanted legitimacy, but not criticism, especially not social criticism. 
and they especially wanted to limit the demographics of video game players to themselves, and the range of video games made to those that participated heavily in the aestheticization of war and technology. We're not getting into the entire history of Gamergate, but what I will share is an anecdote of mine that I think will tie this together. When I was younger and stupider, I was at a point where I didn't pay attention to the world around me and was insulated from many things by virtue of my political and social apathy. I found a subreddit called r Tumblr in action. The entire subreddit is confused and exasperated people desperately trying to reason through dumb SJW, god I hate that word, posts on Tumblr. I found that I started to frequent that huge subreddit every day and I became more and more stupid, for lack of a better word. I was annoyed at things that I didn't particularly care about or know about past an emotional core of, this sounds mean and bad, and then I started to turn into a smug little prick and talk about stupid stuff like the regressive left and id poll. I watched some Sargon before he went Nazi and Blair White and Armored Skeptic and Shoe on Head before she was more outspoken about her Sochdem beliefs. I know, I sounded like a tool and I watched dumb stuff. <laughs> By the way, I still hated those social justice warrior cringe comps, though. I cannot stand stuff that is designed to embarrass its subjects, even in modern day. I grew out of this once I realized how that flavor of idiot looked on other people, and I stopped frequenting that subreddit. Unfortunately, it's still full of softcore social justice warrior suck poo poo pee pee types, but eh, at the end of the day, they just like spectacle and low hanging fruit to chew on. I'm better now and more politically aware. Twenty four. Mood ban gamer gators from 4chan. After loudly protesting a violation of freedom of speech, they soon set up shop in the ever more lawless 8chan, specifically the Baphomet board. Soon, the new reactionaries noticed and affiliated themselves with Gamergate. Theodore Beale, Box Day, Serial Rapist, Daryush Val uh, Valizade, <laughs> Rush V, who used it to launch Reaction, Davis Arini, Paul Mason, Thunderfoot, Carl Benjamin, Sargon of Akkad, Janet Bloomfield and Karen Strogan of A Voice for Men, Mike Cernovich, and Milo Yiannopoulos of Breitbart, among others. While the Gamergate subject has largely faded, the war machine it built has not. It has instead been assimilated into the rest of Neo Reaction. You gotta take a real hard look at yourself when you get banned from 4chan, of all places. Anyway, I've come to realize people who cry free speech at any cost are usually the ones who will pathologize you about being a big baby because you didn't react well to their disrespect. So in reality, it's just, why didn't you let me get away unscathed? Anyway, all these internet tough guys were happy to finally embrace the power and control to make people do what they wanted without consequence, since consequence was seen as limiting free speech in this case. And on YouTube, where your word is your persona, somebody who is marching to the war machine of ethics in video game journalism will continue to rail against any ancillary part to that Trojan horse, including feminism, women in video games, media portrayal of video games, politics in video games, my favorite, as if video games like Halo aren't super political already, etc. And finally, 25. In 2016, Moldbug was invited to speak at LambdaCom, a small conference for functional programming, about his new startup, Urbit. When his past was brought up by concerned people of color, the person who led the conference attempted to justify including Moldbug in liberal language. People shouldn't be excluded for their belief systems, after all. White supremacy in San Francisco is apparently a notion of inclusion. 
Many speakers withdrew, including David Nolan, a highly respected closure contributor and black man. But the functional program and community as a whole began to employ all the standard liberal arguments about free speech and censorship. We end this two-parter off with this little ditty. I cannot stand the appropriated use of language and lack of discretion when referring to some principles as a belief system. I guess it's partially because I have morals and partially because I'm a fairly lexical person, but using something like respect for people of color as a belief, something that by definition does not require a dose of incredulity or suspension of disbelief to consider, is disingenuous and sadistic. The tax sector has been known to be a sausage party and such stupid justifications for his previous behavior. Besides the fact that he was a coward, proves the arrogance at being able to say, it's a belief. It's like Tom Cruise hollering at that reporter when asked about Scientology. It's my religion. I swear to God. <laughs> the Bay Area used to be known as white hippie paradise, but now all the hippies got day jobs as software engineers. Sounds like something Tom Wolf would have written about. I honestly wish more of these bad actors would stop whining about censorship and either have the balls to continue talking like the morons they are, with zero remorse, or just stop talking altogether. And that concludes this two-parter on Josephine Armistead's The Silicon Ideology. Join me again in episode 11, everyone. Until we meet next time, this is Fina saying goodbye. See you later, everyone. Two, seven, five, three.